Hello and welcome to Living Proof, the Isaac Newton Institute podcast. My name is Dan Aspel and I'm your host. In today's episode, I'll be speaking to Rachel Thomas and Marianne Freiberger of PLUS magazine. PLUS works closely with I and I to help explain, celebrate and publicise the research that happens here. But what challenges does that present and why should we do it in the first place? We'll be discussing these questions and more. We hope you enjoy the episode. So welcome to Living Proof, and today we have Rachel Thomas. Hello. And Marianne Freiberger. Hello. Now, Rachel and Marianne, you have been on the podcast before, because we did an episode where we spoke about Plus Magazine in particular, and I urge anyone that hasn't listened to that to go back onto uh, Living Proof Archives and have a look there. But today, we're going to talk a little bit more about communicating maths and how we do that together, which I hope will be of interest to the listeners. So recently, you were working on an event which was to do with the Newton Institute, which was the Gateways uh, Communicating Mathematics event, which is two weeks ago. And in fact, the last two podcasts in this series have been based around it. And you spoke at it, and you were there for both days, I think. Yeah, it, so, was a, it, was a really, it was a really interesting event. I mean, both to cover as part of our work for the INI, but also it was a really, it was a really great event, both as part of the team working at the INI to be involved but also as you know maths communicators it was really it was quite energizing actually because it wasn't just about all types of communication of maths it was specifically about communicating maths for the public which is what we'd been doing particularly during our time in the pandemic we've been working with this team of um, COVID researchers called Juniper Consortium so we were talking about our work with them. And it was not just about communicating maths for the public, though it was important that all of our material was accessible for the public and uh, and it was well used, actually, during the time and, and some since. But it was also directly written for policy, for um, cabinet office, for... Uh, say It went into SAGE papers and um, spy and papers. So it was for more audiences than just the general public. Mm. And it was really interesting the, um, to hear reflections from different government departments, people from the Office for National Statistics were there, and they have a great comms team. Uh, David Spiegelhold to talk, Demandra Harkness obviously was there as well. And it was a really interesting event to get from that perspective that it was about communicating because it was important, the content was important to communicate and we needed people to understand and also to trust what they were hearing. So that was a really interesting aspect. Yeah, so it was more about the aspect of communicating mathematics that is about information rather than enthusing people for mathematics. So it's you might be dealing with an audience that isn't quite as willing to engage, and you might be dealing with an audience that's sceptical. So, for example, when you're communicating about COVID or when you're communicating about climate change or other scientific issues perhaps artificial intelligence as well there might be a component of fear in the audience or of reluctance so then this becomes very much about trust or as David Spiegelholter would say um, based on Honor O'Neill's theories I think that it's about trustworthiness as well so so that's an a component of communicating mathematics that to us was a new thing thing in the COVID pandemic Mm. through our work with Juniper we hadn't really thought about being particularly trustworthy when we're talking about Fermat's last theorem or something, but it was interesting when you were trying to communicate what the science behind policy decisions, what the science behind um, the decision-making process for policy decisions, you wanted people to accept, to be aware of it and to sort of be willing to accept it. And this whole theory that David talked about was you can't expect to be trusted, you can only act in a trustworthy way. And that was something that we picked up early on from him and his colleagues at the Winton Centre was that you had to be really transparent about what your sources were and what you were working from. You had to make it as accessible as possible and you had to give people the chance to go away and sort of review what you were doing and not present it as a fait accompli. You had to say, this is what this is, um, these, these are the 
decisions I've made, the assumptions I've made, my interpretation, and here's the sources that I based it on. So that was a really, it, yeah, it was a different way of working for us but during the pandemic. And that was the focus of the Gateway event, I think. It was very much focused on that part of communicating mathematics as opposed to the type of communication of mathematics that is just about enthusing people to the subject. Which is important as well, but has a different, um, it's a different aspect. It's so fascinating from what you're saying that communicating maths and, and indeed anything, any science, is almost entirely about who you're communicating it to rather than what it is that you're saying, which I imagine probably doesn't vary that much. You're still trying to put across the same inherent facts or truth, but actually it's who you're speaking to is, is just absolutely essential in terms of how you approach it. Yes, and it's very much, I mean, that came across in the Newton Gateway event a lot because most of the speakers talking about their day-to-day -day work and trying to communicate complex ideas said like, Imagine the person that you're speaking to. And even if you can't try it out on somebody who represents that that audience. Um, so that's essential, actually, because you're not going to get an idea across if you don't speak the language of the people who you want to reach. Mm. And I think the other thing that, I mean, we try and do anyway in all of our work is try and preempt the questions of the reader. But if you have an idea of the person you're telling that story to, then you can yeah you can you can make this you can make your story respond to the thoughts it might provoke in a reader and you're exactly right you need to have a sense of who that is and it was interesting a couple of the people like Tom Irving who was in the um secretariat involved in the spy m group which was one of the modeling groups reporting to the um sage scientific advisors to the government and he was saying the tricky thing with their communication is it originally it wasn't intended to be for everyone to read but in the end he had journalists general public policy makers uh you know so many different audiences all reading the same document and the idea of trying to make it as as useful as possible to all those audiences um what was nice though is he said that aspect of the work actually drastically improved he thought the output's the quality of the outputs that they were putting out because they suddenly realised all these people were going to read it. So that was quite an interesting hmm. outcome as well. Yeah, I, I, I find it really interesting because to anyone who's listening to this who's familiar with the Newton Institute, you'll know that the research programmes here are the frontier of their various parts of the science. So on that basis, I, as a non-mathematically literate person, uh, I'm unlikely to understand any description of it given to its own network And yet it is important that the descriptions of those programs be digestible by a general mathematical audience and ideally by a member of the public that might be interested in what's happening here. Um, I don't know how well we ever succeed at that, but that's a challenge that you guys have to face because everything you produce on uh, the PLOS magazine website is completely digestible by the general reader and you are covering events which are happening here at the Newton Institute. And to add one other point to that, I've had... Um, academics here really generously tell me that actually they're in an adjacent part of mathematics and they don't understand what's going on in a particular research program which made me laugh a lot and made me feel slightly better about the, the difficulty we face but how do you address that then how do you come to topics which are very far down the road for a very sort of for want of a better word elite subset of researchers yet we want to make them approachable by the rest of the world Well, any bit of mathematics either comes from somewhere or goes somewhere or both, right? So coming from somewhere means that it comes from some basic mathematics that people will have met at school. Even if you have to go very, very you know, a long way back in history or a long way back in the development of the theory. But there's usually a seed, you know, like algebraic geometry sounds complicated. But really, many people will know that there's an equation describing a line or a circle. And that's where it comes from. Or, and P, um, mathematical areas go places, so they may have applications. Not always, and that's not the most important thing, but they often do. So then you can, you have that angle to go on. So I think in every bit of maths, if you look carefully, you will find something that people can relate to. Either because it's, it comes from, or it's related to some very simple maths, or because there is an application that people are interested in, you know, so... You know, we recently did a podcast from a program here um, 
which is about which was about liquid metal batteries, which may be a revolutionary concept in batteries, which is very important given the energy crisis, which is linked to a very theoretical you know, area of mathematics, very difficult area of mathematics. So there's that angle. Sometimes it's number theory, and then we can say, well, you know, we can come up with these simple, simple sounding problems in number theory that can enthuse people that are still really hard to answer. So there's usually, there's always an angle if you look for it. And I think I still act very much, although I might have more mathematical experience because I've worked in this for a while and I had maths training, I only, the maths training I did at uni, sadly, I've not really covered any semi-group theory yet that I'm aware of. That I'm, so it's not, um, it's not necessarily, I never get to work on things that I learnt, but I think I think of myself as a standard reader. And so, for example, um, one of the programmes recently at the INI, the um, Hydrodynamics Dispersion Programme, so... I kind of went into it and I went, okay, I'm going to look into what they're talking about. And then I just look up all the words I don't know. And I keep stepping back and stepping back and stepping back until I hit the stuff I know. And then I build back up again. And basically for me, particularly that's a good example, that was going, okay, well, let's start from the point of waves. We'll we'll write a series of explainers about waves. We'll see where we can get to. And then we hit the bit of the program where they were talking about some of the applications like in oceanography or in um, sort of applications in optics. So I think that's quite interesting that the way I ended up tackling my learning for the project in order to cover it actually ended up forming the way I wrote about it as well. Because you want to lead... we Because, as you said... The work being done at the INI is so incredibly cutting edge. It really is at the frontiers of the of the subject that we want to be able to cover it for the alumni of the of the INI and potential people coming to look. But we also want to provide this pathway of stepping stones from, you know, those applications or those initial concepts in mathematics and and provide this pathway that you can follow along as long as you like as long as as you're interested in and hopefully get you to the point where you can start reading about that cutting edge mm-hmm. research and even if it's just that you might be reading about something you know that is still being already being taught at school or at university and even if that's where you stop so you don't go to the cutting edge if you if you if you're given the awareness that this is a bit of maths that is part of what is being done here at the Newton Institute and is essential, I think that's already an important bit of knowledge for somebody to have, to see that, you know, okay, I don't know, complex numbers is something that you may have heard of, but it's not, you know, it's advanced, but it's not too advanced, but they play a central role in very cutting-edge stuff. So It's, it's kind of like you say, okay, we're standing here on this stuff you know and have an awareness of, and we can't take you there, but look at the horizon. There's that stuff on the horizon, and that's how you can see the road that gets there. We're not going to go down it because that's going to take a long time. <laughs> but, like, I can see it over there on the horizon. So I think that's the that's the way we kind of handle the cutting-edge stuff. But I think lots of – it's very – to get to that level of knowledge that these subject specialists have, you know, they – I think it's. I don't think it's an unusual experience. We go to mass conferences and people joke about how much of each lecture they have heard if it's outside their subject special the specialism. So, yeah, I think I think it's it's we're used to talking to our peers about the stuff we know, and they're just talking to their peers about the stuff they know. And and maybe people outside of maths don't know just how much people don't understand each other. In maths. <laughs> <laughs> so that literally people won't understand you know, the project descriptions of another program here, Mm. people may not understand, yeah. I really liked your descriptions there, so thank you both very much for that. I was, rather perversely, I was left wondering, have you ever found a subject which has broken that rule and which you simply can't find a way to approach or to explain? Oh, we we always... Definitely. (laughs) (laughs) I'm trying to... I remember we had to cover... uh, one of the winners of the Fields Medal, and they were working the Langlands programme... And I think nowadays I might, not on the spot, but I could probably do a better job of writing about what the Langlands program is. But at the time, I wasn't going to be able to do it. So instead, it was trying to write about 
the mode was it um you, you wrote about the the little lemma that could so he'd proved this lemma that was the basis for further maths and it was and it was then more about writing about the process of mathematics and how mathematical proof can work and how it's collaborative and how it builds on the work of others yeah so definitely I mean I routinely hit things I don't understand and you just you have to just do the best that you can and sometimes it might be the human story or the story of maths as a creative process that you can tell rather than specifically but we have been to amazing that that um another the international congress of mathematics which is where they awards the fields medals we went to one in 2018 in rio where manjul bhargava got one of the fields medalists and routinely at those conferences i'm excited if i get into like if i can get into minute 10 still following i'm thrilled he gave the most amazing lecture his fields lecture you could understand all the way and i you know and i and it, and it was so exciting and i think when you hit a researcher who's got that capability to tell talk about their research in a way that is still describing the cutting edge but taking everyone with them is amazing i think hmm. but i think to answer like going back to your question I personally have often hit <laughs> barriers as well. And I think I remember about 17 years ago, my very, one of my very first interviews in my job was here. I interviewed somebody here at the Newton Institute and I had to bin it, the interview. I could not understand the maths. Um, so I failed there. But I think so personally, we've hit that situation a lot of time. But I think in general, I do firmly believe that in any like any kind of area of maths, you can find something yeah. that you can talk about. So we can't always do it, but you can in theory, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. And we could give it a pretty good try. <laughs> and it's, um, it's occasional that you get a, uh, a newsworthy story which has something which uh, a, a mainstream news outlet could put in a headline. And that doesn't happen very often. If it says something, you know, 300-year-old conjecture finally proved or... Uh, green grocers have been proved right in stacking their oranges this way or, or that way that's a real gift isn't it and I mean how often do they come along well the the kind of headlines where they explicitly link to maths is not so often but uh I wish we had more time actually because quite often you hear stuff on the news that you think oh damn I could have written something about that if I'd had the time um like there's examples of like during the Olympics, you know, the construction of, say, the velodrome was actually incredibly mathematical or, um, I mean, sport, you, our old boss, John Barrow, loved writing about sport. He could find a mathematical story in every sporting headline. So I think it's pretty rare that they actually make that point in the, in the newspapers. But it's, it's such an underpinning thing now of, um, of all science and technology but even things like elections and stuff, you can all, like, my theory is if, if I had the time, I could write a mathematical story about almost anything. But, yeah, it's, it's whether you have the time and whether people have the inclination to, to um, let you free like that. Yeah. And I think, sadly, there is mathematics in many things, but often that's not what maybe people expect to read about so if they read about climate change they might people might not want or expect to be reading about the fact that mathematical modeling is essential in understanding it um, and therefore people don't want to report about it in this way so it it sort of remains hidden I think COVID has given us a little bit of a chance for that to change because I think with COVID everybody went like oh there's an R number what is that that's a mathematical concept and maybe the idea that there are mathematical models telling us, helping us decide what to do and what's going to happen in the future has come across more. But essentially, mathematical modeling is behind so, so, so many things. But it normally doesn't get talked about. It's a bit of a, yeah, I was going to say taboo, but it's not a taboo. <laughs> <laughs> a hidden thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, interesting because the, for the benefit of the listeners, the relationship that the Newton Institute has with Plus Magazine is that we've taken on Plus Magazine as a partner, essentially, to help us communicate what happens here at the Institute because that's your specialty and we're in need of it. So it's a great partnership. And actually, um, there is a page on the Newton Institute website which lists all the articles you produce which are associated 
with Newton activities. And they obviously go on your website and it, it's, a, it's a great help. Um, I guess my question related to that is how important do we think it is to communicate what happens in these research programs to the general populace? Well, I think you've got to think there's two, there's two audiences for why it's important. So the first audience for why it's important, which I think is a battle we are now winning, where we weren't winning it as much when we started however many years ago, is for the researchers, it's important that they communicate what they're doing, frankly, because they're more, almost all funded by public money and they need to make the case for why they're getting that public money and, and to people like to the funding councils, to their university settings, to their peers and colleagues, and ultimately to convince you know, to make sure that the society knows how important the work they're doing is. Um, and I think that is now much better accepted and a lot of research council funding now comes with you have to do a component of communication and public engagement with your work. And then the other audience is, um, is the general public. Uh, and because we, we, I think when you're wanting to increase the appetite for young people to enter the field, if you're wanting to increase um, people's sort of kind of like numeracy. So like we expect everyone to be literate, to be able to read, understand the stuff they're being told, apply critical judgment to what they're reading. You need to be applying the same idea with mathematical and scientific concepts to a certain degree to be, you know, just a, met a citizen of the world and, and understanding the news and stuff like that. So I think they, you might, don't need to know about the cutting edge of research for that, but you need to know that cutting edge research is happening. And I think the approach we try and take is you try and give people a, a link to that cutting edge research so that they can follow that path as long as they're interested. And the other thing is, frankly, there's a huge appetite in the general public, which is demonstrated more and more with the types of content that's more popular for understanding not just general mathematics, but what is happening at the cutting edge and what, what is happening, you know, across between mathematics discipline and other areas. So I think there's a real appetite as well in, in the public for understanding and, and learning more. Mm. And perhaps mathematics is a subject where it can be hard to understand how the maths that you learn at school is useful. I mean, we, we had this discussion quite recently when Rishi Sunak suggested people should learn maths until they're 18, and then people go like, but I never needed the maths I've learned. Oh. Um, and maybe particularly in this situation, it's just useful if people who want to have the opportunity to just find out how is that, how does that, what they learn at school, how does that link to cutting-edge mathematics? Where is the link? Which maybe in other subjects is easier to see. You know, perhaps if you do biology at school and you learn about cells and then you know that, you know, cancers, a cancer is a bunch of cells, so you can see directly where the link might be. In maths, it's harder, so there needs to be something that allows people to make the links. Mm. Yeah, and it's interesting what you were saying previously about the quality of a particular field's medalist who was able to explain their research and take everyone with them, because we have similar things here. You must have it all the time. Uh, I record a video interview with the organisers of each programme, And I, I, I'm certainly not going to praise any or disparage any because it may just be linked to their subject matter. But certain explanations I find really engrossing and involving as a general listener and viewer. And others, it's a little bit harder for me to connect with. And I'm, I'm not saying that's due to the way that it's presented. I'm sure it's just the subject matter itself. Because if you can get that hook and, and get that interest, then you know, you're, you're there for the journey. Um, so, I mean, in some cases, it's an uphill battle. Some cases it's not. You must have easy days and hard days with the subject matter you're dealt. I mean, there's nothing more exciting, I think, than when you have a researcher who is a talented communicator communicating their work and their passion and their enthusiasm and their excitement and their motivation. I mean, that is that is the best, you know. Um, but not everyone has to be a great communicator, and that's why people like, you know, Dan and, and Marianne and I, you know, like why we're doing the job we're doing because... That's not what everyone wants to do, but we can help them um, do it. But I still think those times when you find that person who can tell the story themselves or a lot of work we do is we work with them to try and help them find the words to tell the story themselves. So by podcast or video is so nice. If you can 
if you can get them to the point that they can tell a story that's engaging or you provide structure around the interview to help them. Um, so I guess that's what we still want to capture the people doing the research on PLUS. That's a big, important thing for us, that we want to celebrate the researchers as well as the research they do. But sometimes you have to provide some people with more um, support structures to tell their story than others. But ultimately, yeah, if you can get their words, you know, if you can help them find their words, then I think that that makes it really exciting. Yeah, it's an interesting thought. And I guess I had one uh, more question on the topic, which is that you're just two people and, and you know, you, you've become uh, you know, the risk of embarrassing you expert at what you do because you've been doing it for a while and you produce a great magazine. But if you had more resources available to you, what, what's the sort of um, what's the utopian goal of what you're doing? Uh, can you imagine like a future, impossible or not, which is the result of perfect communication of mathematics or, or science in general? Well, that's like, what, a good question. What would you like the end result of your work to be, I guess, is a shorter way I, of saying all of this? I would love it, I think. I would love it if people could see how maths is sort of everywhere. Um, and this still isn't really the case. I mean, I have... A, most of my friends are probably non-mathematicians and not vaguely connected to maths. And I, st you know, and I often get the questions like, but what does that have to do with maths? So I think the general idea is still that maths is very contained. So it's, you know, it's a very specific set of tools. And it's that if you look out the window and you see this tree and you see a house that has been built by architects, you see a road that has been built by engineers, that that's not got maths in it. And I would love a world where people knew that. And also where they'd realized but maybe this sounds patronizing. Well, you can cut it out if I sound <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd also love it if people, perhaps, if more people understood how maths is a, a language of, of rhythm and patterns. So, again, like, it's not about numbers, it's not about equations. I mean, it is partly, but I mean, first and foremost, it's, 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 it's understanding structures and forms. So again, that means that it's everywhere. It is in a tree and it is in, you know, a house or something. I would love a world where everybody could appreciate that. Yeah, so looking around with your maths glasses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think as well, the thing I still find strange because I never felt it is that you routinely, you know, you meet someone at a party and you say you work on maths and they're like, oh, I hated maths in school. I never wanted to do it again. And I would like it to be as inviting a subject as art, as music, as, you know, health and medicine, you know, that it that it's not a fearful subject and you don't have to come into it thinking, oh, my God, I'm not going to understand anything. But recognise it's, you know, it's a creative, dynamic pursuit that people do because they love it and they're motivated by it and that anyone is welcome. I think that's the thing I would, in my utopia, is that everyone is welcome into the maths world and no one has to fear that they're, you know, not going to understand it. Because, you know, one field's medalist isn't necessarily going to understand the work of another field's medalist, but they're just... There was a great interview with um, Andrew Wiles a while ago and he gave this brilliant explanation of one of the reasons why he was at the top of his field and he went because I got really I'm really good at being stuck and I'm and I'm not frightened to be stuck and I'm and I can I can bear it and I was like god that's a brilliant thing and it's and that idea with our colleagues on um the Enrich project work with students and one of the things that our colleague Liz always says is is understand that everything you try in maths, it's all information, it's all good, it doesn't matter if it doesn't solve your problem, you've learned something. And that idea that you just can have a go and you can get involved, I'd, I'd love that, that people had that sense of maths belong to them and they're welcome in that world. Mm, yeah, because it's more than half of people that you speak to in social circumstances who, who say either I was terrible at maths or then go on to say that, that their teacher was terrible. And I think that's incredible. It must be such a like an overwhelming number of terrible teachers in maths for that to be true. And I'm absolutely certain that it's not. Yeah. Um, I think there's a societal thing. We, we went to a conference in India quite a long time ago. It was in 2010. And it was interesting there. There was, I mean, I'm not, I don't know. I'm, I haven't spent a lot of time in India, but the people we were talking to who worked at the conference who were from India, they said there wasn't quite the same fear of mathematics and the kind of, you didn't need to know it. So I wonder how much it is to do with society um, and whether that's something we can change culturally. And I do think that, 
you know, people are interested in their health, you know, people appreciate art and music. I just hope people, I would like people to feel that, you know, accessible, that maths was, was there for them to enjoy as well. So well, you're in the right job and you're doing it well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So before I let you go at the end of this conversation, what are you looking forward to that's coming up soon in terms of your coverage of what I and I does? Well, um, there's a program that's just started that's running for quite a long time, uh, about data-driven engineering, which I'm really looking forward to covering some application to the energy crisis and some of the more theoretical sides to it. Yeah, so I haven't started diving into that yet, but I'm really looking forward to working on that. And there's another programme that is already running as well, but it's going on until June, called the Mathematical Theory and Applications of Multiple Wave Scattering. And I'm looking forward to that because waves are everywhere, um, from sound waves to electromagnetic waves to water waves all sorts of waves and they all get scattered off something often um, so I imagine that this field has a lot of applications and some very very sophisticated mathematics mm, yeah fantastic well, how about you Dan me. what are you looking forward to doing <laughs> just another day in the office just, <laughs> every day is a gift um, thank you very much for taking the time uh, both of you it's been a pleasure uh, so thanks Rachel thanks Dan and thanks Marianne Thank you, Dan. Super. See you again Bye. soon. Bye. Okay.